Hi everybody. Welcome to my second video about the Nikon N6006, or as it's known outside the US, or as we like to call it, the logical part of the world, the F610. This video is going to look at some of the in-depth features. We talked, we did a general overview in the first video. This video is going to look at how to do a lot of things. It's a much more hands-on video. First thing we're gonna do is talk about loading, or mounting rather, and unmounting a lens. So let's take a look at this. The first thing to do, this isn't actually required, but I like to put the lens, the camera into manual mode, manual focus mode. Now you can see here that here is the screw drive for the autofocus. If I push on it, it just recedes into the camera body. So you can definitely mount a lens with the screw drive up. I'm paranoid and don't like to because I'm always afraid that I'm going to manage to break the lens, uh, the, the screw drive somehow. I'm going to use a standard kit lens that does not have a screw drive connection on it, but it will still work and autofocus will still work on it if I can figure out how to make it, there we go, how to make it mount. So when you mount the lenses, the aperture, the uh, f5.6 rather, uh, on your aperture scale aligns with the dot that tells you where to place the lens, and then you turn it counterclockwise to mount it, and that's how you mount the lens. To, uh, to unmount the lens, all you have to do is push the lens release button right here and turn it clockwise, again back to f5.6 and take it off and that is lens mounting and unmounting. It's very, very easy to do with these bayonet systems. Um, the first lenses, obviously, were not bayonets. You have to screw them in or do other fiddly stuff with some of the interchangeable range finder lenses. Next thing we're gonna do is look at how to load and unload film. One thing you wanna make sure of, which I forgot to do, is that you're, to turn your camera on for this because the camera is going to automatically take the film into the take-up spool. Normally when I do this, I leave the camera back open and show people how this works, but I can't do that with an automatic camera like this. So advance, take the film out and advance it until the end of the film is aligned with this red dot or square rather, and then close the film back. Push the shutter button and then it's automatically going to advance the film three frames. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Now, if you were doing this in real life, don't open up the back of your camera because you'll ruin your film. Your, this film's already ruined, so it's perfect for this demonstration. But um, don't open your film, your camera, until the film is completely shot and then completely rewound back into the cassette. Light outside of a controlled exposure will ruin your film instantly. So here you can see where before the, lead, the leader ended here, now we've got solid film, and that's because it's taken up three roll, three shots in the, into the take-up spool. And now it's going to automatically do a 30 second exposure because I forgot to change it to manual mode. There we go. So, Let's try that again in manual okay. mode. So I'm gonna take a shot here in manual mode. And you can see, when I take that shot, that the film advances along here. And you can see when I was talking about in the previous video, these dashed rails here help keep the film lined up vertically. And there's two rails underneath these sprocket holes right here that match up with the film pressure plate on the back that helps keep the film flat. And that allows the light coming through the lens to focus properly on the film plane. I just like doing this a lot. It's actually probably really annoying. Anyway, so once you've taken all of your, all of your shots, then you need to rewind the film. To do that, you slide this right here, this little lever to the left. To That's rewind the film, you do exactly what I just did. Just slide this and push this button but the film back has to be closed in order for it to rewind. Okay. Pear, I'll have that for dinner. So that's how to load and unload the film, rewind it. You can rewind the film at any point during the process. Uh, it's always least wasteful to use an entire roll, but if you finish a day of shooting and you're, I, I self-wind my film, so I get 27 exposures per roll typically. But if you're at 22 and you only have two left, 
uh, I'll just finish for the day. I'm not gonna leave two exposures in my camera for another day uh, when it might be a few weeks. I like to see what my film looks like at the end of the week when I develop it myself in my darkroom or take it off to be developed um, at a photo lab. So here's the top of the camera. Right now it's turned off and we turned it on quite simply by switching this switch from off to on and now you can see that the uh, that the LCD panel is giving you some information. So I'm going to turn it off again. I'm going to show you what the LCD panel tells you right at the start. Ah, there we go. Notice how the um, the shutter and aperture data remain on for about eight seconds. When that happens, and now they're off, but they stayed on for about eight seconds, and what that tells us is that the battery is good. If you turn on your camera and the shutter and aperture information turn off immediately, then your battery's almost dead. It's time to get a new one because you might run out of battery in the middle of your roll. The, uh, some other notes, when you're taking a picture, if the shutter speed blinks, yeah. Let's try this in a different mode. So if the shutter speed blinks like it is right now, saying eight seconds, 15 seconds, whatever that time is, if it's blinking, then what it's telling you, oops, is that you are likely to have a shaky image. So if it's blinking, you need to, you might need to find a different way to take your picture unless you're on a tripod or you have it otherwise resting on a fence post or a picnic table, something like that then um, if you have it resting, as you can see, my camera was resting and it still blinked. So it will blink regardless of whether or not it's resting. So you can just ignore that if you have the camera secured. And also, if, um, if the camera if it, uh, says high on it, then that means that it's likely to be overexposed. You won't see that now because of the inside, but if that says high, and that means your, your picture is going to be overexposed and there's too much light for the camera to handle with the film and aperture combination, film, aperture, and shutter speed combination you're using. Likewise, if it says low, the opposite's true. Then there's not enough light for the film, aperture, and shutter combination you're using and your image is going to be uh, underexposed or dark. When you're using the camera, if it says FEE -E down here, this says E for empty, but if that said FEE -E on there, that would mean there's a lens error. I don't have a lens that will triple lens error, so you'll just have to trust me that that's what it will do. I can't unfortunately demonstrate that. Well, maybe that's not unfortunate. So the next thing we're going to look at will be the mode button. And the mode button allows you to change your shooting mode. So that's this button over here on the top in the middle. It says mode on it. So right now you'll see there's an A there. That stands for aperture priority. If I hold down the mode and rotate the function dial, I go to full manual, which is M, program mode, which is P, uh, PM is auto multi-program mode, and S is shutter priority mode. And then we're back to aperture priority mode. So let's talk a little bit about what each of these modes does. We're going to start with PM, which is um, auto priority, mo uh, sorry, auto multi-program. So this works only with Nikon AIS lenses. This is an AIS lens on the camera right now, so that will work. The camera determines the lens's focal length. So the electrical contacts we saw inside the camera's body that connect to the lens that tells the camera what type of lens is on it. So the camera knows it's got a 35 to 80 millimeter kit zoom on it. And the, the, uh, that will then allow the camera to prevent shutter speeds from going below the minimum advisable. So on this lens, it should be shot at 1 60th of a second and above. And the camera knows that. Now, the camera also knows that if this was a 200 millimeter lens, that it should be shot at 1 250th or 1 200th and above exclusively. 500 millimeter lenses, 1 500th of a second and above. So basically the rule is the reciprocal of your millimeter length. If you have a 100 millimeter lens, it should be shot at 1 100th of a second and faster. And to, at no time should a lens be used at less than 1 60th of a second 
there are some if you're hand holding it that is so the camera knows that and what it will do is it's going to say this lens can only be shot at 1 60th and, and faster so I'm going to figure out oh lens error I did get a lens error that's exciting um, so the camera is now going to figure out what aperture and shutter speed to work on work at so what I need to do to fix the lens error is switch this to camera aperture control by putting the smallest aperture 22 at the white line so we can see here and then switching this so that the white dot aligns with the orange line then the error goes away okay so now it's going to tell us that at f5 it's going to shoot at 1 1 25th of a second it knows it's automatically determined that i can't control it now if i go to there we go uh, 1 1 25th again at f5.6 basically it's shooting wide open oops 1 1 1 60th of a second at f5.6 now you can see it's gone down to as slow as 1 60th of a second when i went at at 35 millimeters when i went up to 80 it was at 1 1 25th which is the slowest it feels is advisable but also um it's the fastest that this lens can operate the widest aperture it has at f80 uh, at 80 millimeters is f5.6 so that's how auto multi-program mode works basically it's green mode on modern cameras the camera does everything for you all of the thinking and all of the all of the programming and all of the selection and you just get your film back and maybe it was great hopefully it was great we're going to go to p mode here p mode is one notch with the function dial turning uh, clockwise in p mode the camera determines the exposure by balancing shutter speed and aperture and this can be overwritten so right now 1 1 25th and f5.6 but i can turn the dial and change the aperture oh f11 1 30th f16 1 15th and you can see it's blinking because there's not enough light for me to handhold it safely so i can override that by changing the aperture but it's not going to let me change the shutter speed s mode mode button one click to the right i'm sorry next is manual in full manual you select as the user you select all of the settings and you can use the light meter information to select the cor correct proper exposure or you can intentionally over or underexpose or accidentally over or underexpose i've never personally done that but i'm told it's possible and so what you do is the user is select all the settings the camera is 100 percent at your whim and under your control and it cannot do anything on its own that you don't tell it specifically to do so right now it's going to take a picture at 1 2 50th of a second here i can adjust the shutter speed now there are a couple of different ways that i can adjust the aperture i can either go down here switch this off of the orange line and manually control the aperture as you can see when i do that I went from f22 to f11 that's the only way to control the aperture you can see that i can control the shutter speed here and after the i'm going to wait for a second to let the shutter speed turn off it's going to turn off there it goes now is that 1 500th now it's at 1 500th so what that means is that when you rotate the dial unless you can see the shutter speed it's not going to change the shutter speed which is really useful if you're manhandling the camera while you're trying to get your your image the only way to control the aperture in autofocus or i'm sorry in full manual mode is with the aperture dial on the front of the camera and what that means is that g series lenses cannot be used on this camera if you want to use full manual mode uh, I do not own any G series lenses, so I can't test them out in the other modes, but they have the contacts, so my guess is that they would work in the other modes. If that's not true, please by all means leave me a comment and correct me. Um, this is a camera I'm only going to have for a couple more days, and I'm not going to ever have a chance to test a G series lens on it, I don't think. 
So the next mode is hold down the mode bu button, turn clockwise, is A, aperture priority mode. Now the function button in this, yeah, should control the aperture. What am I doing wrong? Oh yeah, that's what's, what I'm doing wrong. So on an AIS lens, the camera should be able to control the aperture with the function button. Um, either my lens has a problem or the camera has a problem. I'm honestly not sure which. I think it's the camera because this lens works as it should on other cameras. But what I can do to change the aperture is actually rotate the dial uh, on the lens. But I was under the impression that this was supposed to, the function dial I thought is supposed to control the aperture when you're in aperture priority the next mode. mode, holding down mode button and scrolling to the right, is S. This is shutter priority mode. And again, you can control the shutter, but what this does, and you can see here the low I was talking about earlier, letting you know that your image is going to be underexposed. What this does is this says, I want to take a picture at 1 to 50th. Camera, go make that happen. Well, it can't in this case because it's low. So more reasonable, camera, I want to take a picture at 1 15th of a second. And the camera says, okay, that's either going to be F11 or 16, depending on how the light reflects off my hand moving in the background. So the, you tell the camera what your shutter speed is going to be. Now, if you're doing sports photography, let's say, and you want to have a frozen diver right as they enter the water, you just say, camera, 1 2,000th of it, wrong way. You say camera wrong way. Yeah. You say camera one two thousandth of a second. And it's going to, if you have the correct lens and film combination, then it'll tell you what aperture it's going to have uh, you use and will take the picture. As you will also need at that speed to have a fairly fast film. All right, so I'm going to hold down the ISO button and it's telling me that the DX code tells this that it is ISO 100. Now that's correct because the film cassette that I used does indeed have an ISO 100 DX code. And so what you'll need to do to change, to manually override the DX code is hold down the shift button right here and hit the ISO, the DX uh, uh, ISO button. So right now I just uh, got it back to DX code and that tells me it's 100 and I can't do anything. So hold down the shift button. So I press the shift button. Hold down the shift button and hit the ISO. And now when I go, it says 4,000, 3,200. So I can adjust the ISO. Now this is really useful if you want to push or pull process your film. So the, it's rated at 100, but a lot of 100 films can be pushed to 200 or 400. Going more than 400 really is pushing it with a 100 ISO film. Most of them can also be shot at 50 or any stop in any third of a stop in between 25 some of them even at 12 different films have different latitudes and there are different advantages to pushing and pulling your film that uh, give you different artistic effects and different final images than you would get if you didn't push or pull your film and so having a manual override gives you that flexibility and is very useful. I shoot very, very little of my film at the rated ISO. Uh, I often shoot it by overexposing at a stop. So I shoot 100 at 50, I shoot 100 at 100 ISO or 80. I shoot 50 ISO film at 25 or 12. Um, I've shot 400 ISO from anywhere from ISO 50 up to ISO 6400 depending on the type of film. So some of them have a lot of latitude and it allows you to have greater creative influence over your film. It allows you to stretch the way your film works so if you're shooting an entire roll inside in the dark you can just push your film a stop or two and still take images when normally you might not be able to without them all being blurry. Black and white films are really good for pushing and pulling. Color negative films, not as much. Some of them have a stop or a stop and a half of latitude. Slide films, not at all, period, end of story. Um, I know you can pull a slide film up to a stop. I've never tried it uh, because it's too expensive for me to buy slide film and develop it just to find out, oh, hey, I was wrong about that. 
but black and white film is very easy to push and pull. I do it all the time and strongly, strongly recommend it. Uh, the ISO rating on a film the is next only button here is the drive and AFL lock, autofocus lock button. So what this means is if you hold the button and rotate the command dial, you can select the drive mode. Single shot, represented by the S. Continuous shooting high, which is two to two and a half frames per second. And continuous shooting low, which is 1.2 frames per second. And back to single. Those are the three modes. And in the 90s, that was pretty good for a mid-range camera. In today's terms, with digital, that's kind of slow. The bracketing mode over here, oh, you can also do an autofocus lock, which means that your camera, no matter where you point it or what's in front of it and how far away, will not re-autofocus. And if you do that, you have to turn it off. So you saw how I pushed the shift button, autofocus lock, no lock. And now, if I have the right lens on there, it would autofocus. But uh, I don't have the right lens on there. Mine, mine won't autofocus on this camera. Bracketing. So if you've never bracketed before, that's what this button's for. Bracketing is where you take an image that's underexposed, properly exposed, overexposed, or five images, or seven, and you can space them out by a third, a half, two thirds, or a full stop. And it gives you the ability to, uh, to make sure you get the right picture. And film photography is more for getting the right picture. Oh, hey, here's this really dark area in my, in my frame and a really blown out light area over here and a couple of highlights and I'm having an interesting time controlling. So I'm gonna take a picture at 1 125th at f5.6 because that's what the camera says I should do. But I think that's wrong, but maybe it's right. So I'm also gonna take one at f4.5 and then another one at f6.3 or another one at f4 and another one at f8 or 1 1 25th, 1 60th, and 1 250th, things like that. It's different ways of bracketing. And so what that does is allow you to make sure you get a shot when you otherwise might miss. And it's better to have a couple of not great shots and one good shot than no good shots. Hold down shift, hold down the bracketing button, and let go of shift. One frame, no bracketing. Three frames, a third of a stop three frames, two thirds of a stop, three frames, a full stop. And what that means is one stop underexposed, one perfectly exposed, one stop overexposed, five frames, each at a third spaced, five frames at two thirds spaced, five frames, two stops underexposed, one stop underexposed, properly exposed, one stop overexposed, one stop, two stops overexposed. And that's the end. So those are your bracketing options. Bracketing uh, five at one stop is a pretty good option. As you can see here for bracketing, I've switched over to shutter priority mode to show how it's going to work. And you can see here there's a number five. That's going to count down from five to four to three to two to one each time I take a shot. And you'll be able to see the shutter change or the aperture change. Well, I'm sorry, you'll be able to see, I think, the aperture change every time I take uh, an image. So there we go. First one was F11, F, which was two stops underexposed. F8 is one stop underexposed. F5.6 is properly exposed. F4 is one stop overexposed. And low, which would be F2.8, uh, which this lens cannot do, is properly, is two stops overexposed. So it'll just go as far, with, in this case, it'll go to as far open as it can go, which is F4 and then call it a day. So that's how the auto exposure bracketing works. Basically what you're doing is you're just framing your image with multiple settings easily and rapidly so that you can obtain various results and make sure that you get the best shot. The next button over here is the metering mode. And the metering mode allows you to change between matrix meter, metering, you can see the matrix symbol right there above my, the, Excuse me. You can see the matrix symbol right there above the flashing eight. Center weighted metering, spot metering. 
So spot metering is just a little tiny dot, and you can see this how the shutter speed is changing with different metering types because it's picking up different parts of what's off camera, which is a series of reflectors. And right now it's just picking up a dark part of a reflector. Now, the dark part mixed with a light part, one eighth of a second, and all of the light and dark areas combined, which still is one eighth of a second. You can see the, the setting change, and I talked about a little bit in the first video, we'll talk a little bit again about how metering works. If what you see right here represented everything that you saw through this camera's viewfinder, matrix metering would be it would take the entire scene and it would assume that what it's looking at is a middle tone gray. So it would tell you to make this entire scene middle tone gray. Now in reality, you would still get to see an actual image. It wouldn't just turn out to be flat gray. But if you had a black, solid black mass or a solid white mass, the camera would always assume it's looking at 18% or mid-tone gray. And so it would calculate an exposure to make the image look like that. Now the reason this works very well is because even though it assumes that this whole thing is a mid-tone gray, areas that are light will still appear lighter because they're contributing evenly to the metering. This will still appear lighter. Areas that are dark will still appear darker on the image, and areas that are mid-tone will appear gray. Or if you're shooting color, will appear, they'll appear that color, but the meter works the same way. Um, now, in center-weighted metering, if you take this area in the center here, this circle, let's say, approximately like this, that represents 60% of the metering information that the camera gets, and then everything else around it represents the balance of the 40%. And that means that if you have a center-focused subject, like a person you're taking a photo of or something like that, that they represent the majority of the uh, metering data. The last one is spot metering, which means just the very center, say where my fingernail is, is used for collecting meter information. So if you have a very dark center and a, an averagely lit surround, you're going to end up with an average looking center and a really blown out surround. Likewise, if you have a very light center and an average surround, you're going to end up with a very mid-tone center and a really dark surround. And so the function of the meter, which is to assume that what it's seeing is a flat mid-tone gray, doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the space in which the metering data comes from. That's what the different metering modes do. The next thing we have is the self-timer. The self-timer works by holding it down and selecting how many, uh, how you want to take your picture. So I'm going to scroll all the way back here. This is the way it's supposed to be. So it starts at one frame. That's what 1F means. 2 is 2 seconds. So now you can select how many seconds you want for the self-timer in single second increments up to 30 seconds for one frame. So now if I scroll back here to, to let's say 4 seconds. So I set it at one frame 4 seconds. I hold down the self-timer button take the sh press the shutter button it counts down to four and then takes a picture now if I select that and then I release it and hit the shutter button the self timer doesn't work so in order to use the self timer you have to hold this button down and then press the shutter release and walk away and the self timer will count down you can also oops wrong way once you get up to 30, the next step is two frames at 10 seconds. So you push the cell, hold the self timer, push the shutter release, walk away, get up with your friends. All right, let's 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 take a serious shot, everybody. Serious shot, smile, say cheese. There we go, taking the serious shot. Okay, everyone, we've got a few seconds. Let's re- There we go, and uh, we didn't get the goofy shot in. So at any rate. You got the serious shot and then a bunch of people looking at you like, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Oh wait, okay. Anyway, so the two frames will take two shots. So you could line everybody up, tell people we're going to take two shots, take two serious shots. That way if anyone's blinking in the first one, they aren't in the second one and so forth. Or you can take a serious and a goofy shot, whatever it is. But it gives you a backup shot just in case. Also, if you're really running, really running if you at least end up in one of the shots if you have a very distant subject. At any rate, that's how the uh, self timer works. Going over to this side, we have the flash exposure compensation. So we're going to hold down the shift button and then this allows you to manually 
change how much the, sh the flash is going to be brighter up to three stops or dimmer down to one, I'm sorry, brighter up to one stop or dimmer down to three stops. For some reason, dimmer is on the right side and brighter is on the left. So at any rate, let's say that you want to have a nice low lighting effect and you know that if you just trust your TTL meter to use the flash, it's going to flash at power and give you that 18% flat tone that we were talking about and your model is going to look very pasty and shiny. But you can override that, go two stops underexposed, and there you're going to have a nice low light flash, which is going to give you a good atmosphere and some nice dark tones and a good background uh, recession that gives you a pretty decent portrait. So that's what that's for. You can do it for other things than portraits as well, but that function simply overrides the flash's power to give you cre creative control over the way in which the flash operates. This button is your exposure compensation. So you, this is basically doing the same thing as bracketing, only manually. So for in some cameras, this camera does not have an interchangeable focusing screen, but in some cameras that do, you have to compensate with a different uh, focusing screen. Also, um, the other thing you can do is you can use that in, to push or pull your, your film a stop. If you do push and pull your film, you have to do it for the entire roll, not just part of it. By and here's how you change the battery. Ow, 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 ow. That shouldn't hurt. You just push that down and then the battery slides out. It takes a type 223 battery. You can get those at any drugstore because they're pretty common for medical devices and other types of cameras. There we go. And the flash, uh, it has a flash hot shoe up at the top, as I said, and it does not have a PC port, unfortunately. So in order to control a flash off your camera, you have to use the hot shoe and either use it with a, an RC, uh, RC adapter or a flash cable or something like that. And it has a sync speed of 1 1 25th. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. Let's say that what you're seeing here represents all of the light coming through your lens and getting to your film plane. Well, uh, studio lamps and microphone are in the way. So here's your shutter, okay? And pretend it's covering up the entire thing. The film's right behind your shutter. And as soon as you take the picture, this shutter curtain moves up and then the next one comes into place, okay? So you take the picture at 1 1 25th of a second, and this is extremely slow motion. 1 1 25th of a second means that that's the slowest speed, or the fastest speed rather, at which the shutter curtain is completely open and the entire film plane is exposed to light. So 1 1 25th, the shutter goes up and then this one follows right afterwards. So for instance, at 1 60th, this would go up and there'd be a slightly longer pause and then this one would follow. At half of a second, this would go up, there'd be a very, very long pause and then that one would follow. Whereas at 1 2 50th of a second, say, it might be something like that. And at 1 2,000th of a second, it might be something like that. And so what would happen is if you sync your flash to let's say one two thousandth of a second, you're going to get a little strip of exposed light somewhere in the middle or at some other point in your film. And then a whole bunch of darkness because the shutter was blocking the light from getting to the film. So anytime you use a flash, you have to make sure that you're using your camera at one one twenty fifth of a second or slower. So there are some other things you could do with your flash. If you left your camera open for a second and then just trigger a flash in a dark setting, then you could capture some moment and get maybe some trails of light or something like that. Uh, you could also use it on bulb where you're just holding your camera open for 30 seconds or a minute or an hour and a half. And let's say you're out taking a picture of a railroad yard or something at night and not trespassing, you have permission to be there and it's really dark so you put your camera on bulb and you put a, a, a release cord in it and you just leave it open while you walk around and you point a flash at train cars and you pop the flash and you selectively light an area. That's another thing you can do. 
So there's a few different things you can do with a flash. The whole long and short of that is 1 1 25th is the uh, fastest shutter speed you can use a flash at and still have light hit the entire film plane. The, um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a quick pause here. I'm going to set this up and we're going to look through the camera's viewfinder and see what you would see looking through the viewfinder. All right, and we're back. So here you can see a couple of the set the reflector set up off camera. And my hand, and my microphone, and my belly. So here we go. This is what you see looking through the viewfinder. So that big, that larger ring, what that indicates is the area that's being metered with center-weighted metering. The smaller ring indicates the area being metered with um, the spot metering. Then the whole mat indicates the area that's metered with matrix metering. The, that little rectangle in the middle is your autofocus point, so that's what the camera is going to autofocus on. Now at the bottom here, we have some information. On the, uh, the left, It'll tell you if uh, here we go if your expo your exposure if you what mode you're in rather in this case automatic if I, or aperture priority so if I hold down mode and rotate the dial I go to manual program program multi it just says P for both of them inside the viewfinder and then to shutter priority and back to aperture it'll tell me the shutter speed here and I can adjust that. It'll also tell me the aperture, f22, and that flashing red flash symbol means I need to open up the flash and use that. Now we'll get back in frame here, and when I take a picture, you can see that it goes dark as the mirror pops up. So anyway, that conclu concludes the um, that concludes the second video about the Nikon N6006 or F610 to the rest of the world. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. If you have any ideas for future videos, please let me know. I'm more than happy if I have the technical knowledge and equipment to make those for you. If, uh, if you have any wait, suggestions, questions, comments, uh, I did all that. Um, Oh yeah, if you give me a thumbs up, that would be great. That lets me know that my content is helpful and that I'm on the right track. And the last thing before the secret hidden Easter egg in this video for everybody who made it through to the end, thank you guys for watching. Wait, 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 wait. Let's try it again.